Hi, in this screencast, I'm going to show you how to get up and running with the Instrument Seller uh, software as a system platform that runs under uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to install MicroShift, which is a condensed version of OpenShift. And then I'm going to show you how to install the Instrument Reseller code on uh, Kubernetes, which is running under OpenShift. And then I'm going to show you how to configure and run the tenants. But before we get started, let me go over the basic structure of the application. Instrument Resellers is a multi-tenant application that runs under Kubernetes. And there are three tenants called, one's called Clyde's Clarinet, the other one's called Betty's Brass, and the last one's called Sydney Saxophones. And they run under a single Kubernetes cluster. And the way that each tenant achieves isolation is through a distinct Kubernetes namespace dedicated to each tenant. The uh, tenants all share the same code base. And the code base is stored as container images in a KIO image repository, as you can see on the left. There are two images. One's called Instrument Reseller Cedar, and the other one's called Instrument Reseller. Instrument Reseller Cedar runs as a knit container under Kubernetes, and its job is to put in some seed data for each tenant. And each tenant will have data specific to its instrument type. For example, Clyde's clarinets will have clarinet data, and Betty's brass will have brass data, and Sydney saxophones will have saxophone data. The second container, called Instrument Reseller, is the actual application code that each tenant will use. Each tenant will have an instance of the application code. The code is generic, but between the specifics of the Instrument Reseller's data and the generic nature of the application logic, we get a distinct tenant for uh, each application running in the cluster. So that's how it works. And so let's get down to business and show you how it's all going to go. Inside of the screen, you can see that there is a terminal window into a Fedora server. And the Fedora server is where the OpenShift Kubernetes cluster will run. But as I mentioned earlier, we're going to use MicroShift, which is a condensed version of OpenShift. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that we have the uh, MicroShift getting started page. So what we're going to do now is we're going to install MicroShift. So the first thing we need to do is to install the Creo uh, container runtime. Um, MicroShift likes that. So we're going to go DNF install Creo. And then it's asking uh, for my password. And that's OK. OK, and then we're going to uh, install Creo. Again, before we set up the bind to the repository. And this just takes a little bit. And now we're going to use system control to enable Creo. And that's done. Now we need to install uh, MicroShift. So let me do, let me clear the screen so you get a better view. Okay. Let's uh, find a repository. Okay, let's install MicroShift. Okay, good. Now we need to set up some uh, firewall access and some ports, open up some ports on the firewall. So we'll set up this IP address is a trusted site. And then we'll open up port 80. Uh, the uh, application will run over port 80 using uh, virtual names, which we'll talk about later on in this video. And let's see, we need to open port uh, 443, which is the HTTPS port. And we'll open port 5353, which is what MicroShift likes. And then we'll reload the firewall. And then we'll use system control to enable MicroShift. Okay, so MicroShift is installed, but now we need a way to talk to it. 
we're going to use that, the way we're going to talk to it is using the OpenShift and Kubernetes clients. So we're going to go get uh, the OpenShift OC and Kube Control clients. And let's decompress that tar, those tar files. Now we need to create a directory where the Kubernetes configuration file will go. So we'll do that. And now we'll do uh, here. Now we'll move the configuration file into a, a friendly place on the uh, Fedora server. And now let's do uh, OC get pods. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, there's no resources found. Okay, let's do this. Let's just do uh, all namespaces. And you see there, there are definitely pods running. Uh, some of the pods are working their way up um, to get up and running. It takes a little bit. There's a lot going on in the background. But now uh, MicroShift, uh, which is the condensed version of OpenShift, is installed and running. So that part's done. All right, so the next thing we need to do is we need to install the uh, source code. And the source code lives in a Red Hat repository called uh, Instrument Resellers. There it is. So let's go clone the source code into the Fedora server. And I'm going to do that by copying and pasting, because as you're seeing, I'm probably not the best typist in the world. Uh, oh, as you can see, I'm... Uh, let's see here. Oh, as you can see, I'm not even the best copy and pastist in the world. But let's try that again. All right. Okay, so now we have the source code. You can see it's in Instrument Resellers. So let's go into Instrument Resellers. And then we'll go into the Open Shift directory. This is all the code. This is the source code, the documentation, everything you need to know about the project is in here. And most of the work has been done already. Actually, all the work has been done already. The only thing we really need to do is to bind an external MongoDB database into the Kubernetes manifest files. So let's, um, let me make this a little bigger here. Let me send this down because we're not going to be using this again for a while. And let me make a nice big screen here so you can see it. And let me clear the screen. And now if you look in here, you'll see there's these YAML files. There's a YAML file for each tenant, brass, clarinet, and saxophone. And within the YAML file is actually a manifest declaration for each resource that the tenant will use, each Kubernetes resource. So let's take a look at brass YAML. And we'll do this by going cat brass.yaml. And you can see this is the manifest file in YAML. And here are all the resources. So let's go through the resources one at a time. The namespace resource is called Betty's Brass. So the namespace is how each tenant is isolated in the cluster. Then we have a deployment. And the deployment uh, defines what pods are going to be running within the cluster for the tenant. And if we scroll down under the deployment, you'll see there are two types of pods. There's a, there's no, actually there's one type of pod, but it has an init container and a container, as I showed you previously at the beginning slide. The init container binds to KIO, the instrument reseller Cedar application, and the containers bind to the uh, KIO Red Hat developers instrument reseller application. And this is the container image that does the data seeding, and instrument reseller is the container image that does has the actual application logic. But if we look down, you'll see that there is a, uh, an environmental variable from MongoDB URL. All these environmental variables define something particular about the tenant. In this case, since all the tenants will actually be sharing the same MongoDB cloud instance, but will bind to a different um, database within the instance, uh, we need to define that database. And again, this database is defined by MongoDB URL. But you can see that the actual URL is contained in a Kubernetes secret. It's hosted in a Kubernetes secret. So if we go down and look at the Kubernetes secret, 
which is here, you'll see that there's a URL property in the metadata, but it's a placeholder, Mongo URL here. And I put that in because what we need to do is substitute the actual URL to the MongoDB instance running in the cloud uh, with, in, with against the Mongo URL here, placeholder. Now we have the service, and the service is how the uh, application exposes itself internally within the Kubernetes network. And finally, we have the route, and the route is the mechanism by which those that are outside the cluster access the internal tenant. And part of the route is to give the uh, tenant its actual host name. And in this case, we're going to use Betty's Brass Local. And we'll see Clyde's Clarinets. We'll have Clyde's Clarinets Local. And Sal uh, Sydney Saxophones will have Sydney Saxophones Local. And this domain name, uh, is what we'll use to access the tenant running within the cluster. Okay, so that's how it all works within the YAML file. Now we need to do is bind it, uh, and it being the MongoDB instance. So let's go back again here. And again, you can see that I had created a utility shell script called set Mongo URL. And the way set Mongo URL works is you go sh, and then we go set Mongo URL, and it takes as a parameter the URL to the MongoDB database running in the cloud. And I'm going to cut and paste that in here. And as you can see here, that is the uh, actual URL with pass username and password. I'm going to change this after the video, so you'll never be able to get in, but that's how it is now. And now you can see here that all the uh, database su URL substitution has taken place. And just to prove it to you, let's go back to here and let's scroll here and you can see uh, there is the secret and now there's the database, which will change after this video is uh, over. All right, so that's done. So now that what I have to do is I have to actually in uh, inject uh, the clarinet the brass and the saxophone resellers into the cluster. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use kube control, apply minus F for file. And in this case, I'm going to do the brass. And you can see that the namespace Betty's Brass has been created and all the other resources that were created too. So we did Betty's Brass. Let's do uh, clarinets. There's the clarinets, and you can see namespace Clyde's clarinets was created. And then let's do saxophones. Okay, we do saxophones, and you can see that the namespace saxophones YAML was created, and all the other um, components, uh, excuse me, Kubernetes resources that are needed were created also. So let's see what's going on. So first we do a kube control uh, get pods, and um, we do that, nothing's found because, again, remember all the pods for the deployment were put in through distinct namespaces. And what do I mean by that? So let's do get pods and let's use the all namespaces. Um, and again, bad typing, let's type kube control, which is the Kubernetes client. And you can see here, and what you can see now is that in the namespace, uh, Betty's Brass, that the init containers are running. In Clyde's Clarinets, the init containers are running. And in Sydney Saxophones, the init containers are running. So everybody's trying to get up and running. And let's take another look. Okay, and let's see, the pods are initializing. Good, so things are happening in there. It takes a little while for this to spin up. Let's take another look. Okay, and everybody's running. So right here, right now, uh, the tenants have been installed. But there's one last little thing we need to do. And I'm going to do this. Let's do OC uh, get routes. I'll use the OpenShift container client, uh, excuse me, OpenShift client. And OC, we'll do get routes and we'll do all namespaces. And as you can see, here are the routes going to each uh, tenant Betty's Brass Local, uh, Clyde's Clarinets Local, and Sydney Saxophones Local. Now, this is fine, but there's only one problem. In order to actually call the route, we have to let the Fedora server know that the route uh, name exists, that the DNS name exists. 
And the way we do that is to put an entry in Etsy host that binds the DNS name to the IP address of this um, server. And we do IP address, uh, grep, and I, I happen to know it's a 192 address. You can see the IP address to this is 250. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go sudo uh, nano, and then I'm gonna go Etsy hosts, and I need my password. And right now you can see that nothing's in here. So what I'm gonna do over here is I'm gonna copy and paste so here it is, and now you can see that I'm going to bind Betty's Breast Local to the IP address, Clyde's Clarinet's Local, excuse me, and Sydney's Clarinet's Local. And um, so it, it will know how to get there. Now, what's interesting is that what will happen is that the uh, domain names will be called against port 80. And Kubernetes, OpenShift and Kubernetes is smart enough to map the domain name port 80 into the internal tenant, <clears throat> excuse me, into the internal tenant service. It's very smart, a lot of auto magic going on, but when I call uh, Clyde's clarinets, it's gonna come in on port 80, but internally within the cluster, uh, OpenShift Kubernetes will map that call, that request call to the uh, appropriate service and port. So let's give it a try. Let's do curl, we're gonna call Clyde's clarinets uh, dot local and we'll go v1 and I happen to know that I built in a health check endpoint so let's do health check and see what happens after I learn how to type okay so let's do v1 health check and you can see that the health check is working Clyde's clarinets is up and running this means now that the cluster is active it's connected to um, the a route, and the next step we have to do is just check that there's some data behind there is indeed uh, Clyde's clarinets accessing the MongoDB database with the seed data. So what we're gonna do is well, let's take a look and say, oh, are there any purchases made? And again, I don't expect you to know this, you have to know the API, but there's an endpoint for purchases. And if we go to purchases, you can see, oh, it's actually connected to the database. That's really, really interesting. And that's really, really good. So right now we're um, bind, we're bound to the uh, database and um, Clyde's clarinets is working. Let's see what happens if we go to um, uh, Betty's Brass. Okay, we'll go Betty's Brass, not local, uh, we'll do purchases. Oh, and there's some stuff for uh, Betty's Brass, you know, a nice horn, that's a brass. That's really good. So there's stuff for brass. That's uh, interesting. Now, the last thing I want to share with you is that when we created this application, which is built on the open API specification, in other words, we created the spec for the API first, and then we implemented the code. Open API has a utility that you can bake into your code that will display the documentation for the API. Now, since this is Fedora server, I can't uh, I went headless. I don't have a web server built in here. There's no graphical UI. What I need to do is to bind my local machine into the remote cluster. And then I'll be able to view the documentation. I know that, that's a lot of words, but um, it'll come out when I do the demo. So what I need to do is I need to go into um, my local machine. And here's my local machine. And what I need to do here is I'm going to need to go sudo and I'm going to go edit the Etsy host file on my local machine. And I need to put in my password. As after I learn how to type. Okay, and as you can see, there's nothing for Betty's Brass Local, Clyde's Clarinet's Local, Sydney Saxophone's Local. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna put that in now. And um, because as you've learned, my, I'm a typing challenge developer, go figure. I'm actually gonna cut and paste it. Let's see if I'm not cut and paste challenged. Okay, there you go. And, and now what it's saying, okay, my local Etsy host knows how to call the IP address of 250 
using the domain name. And that will map into the cluster, into the uh, tenant service running within the cluster against its own internal IP address. Boy, that was a mouthful. You don't have to understand it all. But the important thing is, is now I can use my web browser to actually view the documentation running on the internal uh, server, Fedora server. So let me save on this. Before I can call the tenants running on the Fedora server from my local web browser, what I need to do is I need to open port 80 on the Fedora server. I didn't open that yet. It's port 80 is still locked out. And to do that under Fedora using the Fedora UI, web uh, server UI, I go to networking and I go to uh, edit rules and I go to add a service. And you can see that I, well, let me make it simple. I'll go to 80 and you can see that there's an HTTP service port 80 and I'm going to open up that port. So I'm going to add the service and uh, there it is. It's all running and it's in, you know, the terminal. You can also see that cockpit is open at 9090 and SSH is open at 22. Okay, so that's done. So now let me go to my local web server. Um, excuse me, my local browser, HTTP uh, colon, and then we'll do, uh, let's do Clyde's Clarinets. And now it's going to go to Clyde's Clarinets .local docs, and docs is the endpoint that the baked in open API spec code uh, supports. So when I call it docs, the auto magic within the application code is going to bring up the uh, interactive uh, documentation for the Clyde's Clarinets API. That's the goal. So let's do that. And there you go. See, there's Clyde's Clarinets. And you can see how all the mappings are working. So one of the nice things about the API documentation is that it's interactive. So I can go try it out and I can run the health check. And you can see there's the health check. Clyde's Clarinets works just fine. And if I wanted to learn more, let's say I wanted to get the instruments, I could go try it out, execute. And I scroll down, there's, there's instruments. These, and this is all live data. And the other thing is, if I want to learn more just about the models in general, like in other words, what is an instrument? Uh, the API documentation will uh, show me the uh, description of the uh, instrument model and a purchase, because there it is. It's really informative. It's one of the nice things I like about uh, OpenAPI, and I like about the uh, auto-magicalness of the uh, built-in API documentation display. So there you have it. So let's, uh, let, let's review. Okay, so in this video, what I said I was going to show you was how to install MicroShift, which I did. Then I was going to show you how to install the instrument reseller code on a Kubernetes cluster, which I did. And then I'm going to show you how to configure and run the tenants, each distinct tenants, Clyde's clarinets, Sydney saxophones, and Betty's brass uh, from within the single Kubernetes cluster. And I did that. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it's a little uh, detailed, but the devil is always in the details. And uh, take a look at the code and keep moving forward with it. Thanks for watching. Bye.